Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. This edition of Benchmark. The spotlight is on the IT industry as Ramesh Shamugunathan, Executive Vice President and Group Chief Information Officer of John Keels Holdings, takes the hot seat. Then Nielsen's Managing Director Shaheen Carter discusses the Business Confidence Index, which remains well below its 12 month average. And finally, economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel gives us his take on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark, the Big Picture Business Program. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. IT literacy and internet access for all Sri Lankans is one of the focus areas of the government's five hub concept. Now, to this end, it is noteworthy that Sri Lanka has improved its ranking in the Network Readiness Index in 2012 and of course from there on onwards. To discuss the country's IT industry, we welcome into our studio the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer of John Keels Holdings, Ramesh Sharmaganal. And thank you very much for joining us. So good to be talking to you. Thank you, Savitri. It's good to be back after, after a few years. Now to set the tone for our subject at hand, which is the IT industry, Ramesh, can you just give me a brief overview of the state of the IT industry here in Sri Lanka? Like probably you alluded to, uh, IT has come a long way. In the, in the past decade, so to speak. And uh, you would see IT is uh, becoming very per pervasive and ubiquitous in, in a global context as well as the Sri Lankan context. And uh, increasingly, you're seeing IT finding its way fr from the back office into the front offices and into the core of the business, the thick and thin of the business. And uh, as you see that we would see this momentum of IT's penetration would grow well into the 21st century and beyond. Uh, primarily because today you are seeing uh, digitization, which is the mass confluence of uh, digital services, uh, which is being uh, leveraged and which is being disruptive uh, from a social political context. You would see uh, countries have been toppled through social media, uh, revolutions have been caused through social media, and you are seeing developed economies as well as emerging economies leveraging digitization to the nth level. And there lies the opportunity for countries of our nature, the emerging economies, to leap from. Uh, because even with other infrastructures, if we have the information infrastructure, which gives uh, a huge potential for us to leverage and you know take the country into a different footing. Now, Ramesh, you were talking about leapfrogging, but we can't forget that Sri Lanka is actually in a very competitive region when it comes to IT. Now, if you were to compare Sri Lanka's IT industry with the rest of the region, uh, are we really developing at an acceptable rate? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, I think that's where, if you look at from the Network Readiness Index point of view, amongst Asia, probably Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, India, uh, very, very few economies in Asia is in the top, top half of the NRI uh, index per se. So, which org as well, but uh, with the information infrastructure, I don't think we, our economy has to be confined to the source of Sri Lanka. It opens out a whole new possibilities in terms of the whole addressable market becoming the globe through the medium being internet. I think that's where lies the opportunity for us to uh, look at different business models. Today, for example, uh, look at software as a service. It's an, it's an uh, enablement. Today, people would download applications on iPhone or the Android phones. They don't care who develops and puts it up there, right? Because there is an opportunity because you are hiding behind a bigger brand, but you are actually selling service and getting, and getting monetizing those services. So that is where I feel a lot of these uh, uh, applications and IT services is going to be driven towards consumerization where people will consume services and there'll be a set of guys who will be providing it. Ramesh, there is a almost an inherent danger in looking at indices, I right. would imagine, because either you get complacent because you seem to be doing sure. better, but at the same time, uh, the ground realities may not be what it reflects. Sure. So we are looking at the Network Readiness Index, which is showing us that yes, Sri Lanka is improving, but ground realities, where do we stand? Ground reality, I think that's, that's uh, exact. I think I, I probably endorse your sentiments because if you look at even our uh, literacy rate, now, even from IT literacy, we are growing from 5% to 30%. We are targeting 45 by 2050. 
literacy we had 90 but whether all of those are actually having a snowballing effect in terms of economic activity which is probably the, your question and a valid one uh, there if you if you look at into the grassroots uh, I network readiness index actually looked at multiple attributes in terms of affordability of IT usage of IT as well as infrastructures if you look at usage uh, they look at three aspects people enterprises as well as the government the enterprise and the governments are doing okay but if you look at the people aspect we had a measly nine percent nine points right and that's where if you look at then if you if you critically dissect then you're talking about IT literacy penetration of PCs being at five percent penetration of internet being at ten percent so then obviously you're talking about something where the indexes got skewed because of a small percentile so that's where I would think our addressable uh, real uh, issue is with the people the IT education the penetration of PC penetration of internet whether the masses have latched onto this digital uh, media you touched on exports Ramesh earnings from information technology enabled services in 2012 grew by 22.9 percent which was 436 million US dollars or so now how would you rate Sri Lanka's performance in terms of IT exports and which areas do you think actually have potential for growth I think uh, compared to about a couple of years back we were looking at about exports of 350 million today we stand about 600 million and uh, the IT uh, BPO space I think the employment employed uh, potential from 30,000 has doubled to about 66,000 and they're targeting 2 billion exports by 2020. I think it's achievable but the challenge that I see is whether we are uh, really focusing on our, our USP right because I think uh, sometimes if I think we're trying to play uh, second fiddle to India and trying to mimic their strategies and trying to be you know uh, look at what is successful for them and try to mimic those I think we should stop doing that and, and look at uh, fresh new space because as I said with the internet becoming pervasive uh, 2020 we're talking about 50 billion devices on the internet right and uh, with the IPv6 every device in your home including your micro microwave to fridge everything will be on IP will be on the internet so that gives you a whole new proposition in terms of providing services because you're talking about from not only human to machine communication, machine to machine communication. Your cars will have computers, your uh, motorbikes, everything. All the instruments around you will have uh, computers in it. So which opens a fresh new space in terms of embedded computing and software for it. And I think we should become a, a R&D hub and look at the emerging technologies into the future and see whether we could carve out a niche for ourselves. Because we got very high-end R&D capabilities in the universities, uh, university capabilities are good, but whether new investments are going in this R&D area is a question uh, which probably needs some thought. So let's continue this discussion after a short break. We pause for commercials now and on the other side, Ramesh Shanmuganadhan gives his views on the quality of human resources in the IT industry here in Sri Lanka and also globally what the emerging trends are. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. We are discussing the IT industry, emerging trends, quality of human resources and all that with the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer of John Keels Holdings, Ramesh Shanmuganathan. So Ramesh, let's continue. 
What do you think of the quality of human resources in the IT industry here? Uh, if you if you look at in terms of low end of the value chain, I think we got pretty good human resources in terms of the uh, quality uh, of graduates for graduating out of Moratua, University of Colombo, SLIIT, and numerous other other institutions from the private sector. But the challenge that I would see is that since uh, other than few companies uh, who doesn't uh, who have a clear vision in terms of what they want to do and where they want to take the IT industry and the IT exports, the rest probably are doing a lot of things on trial and error. And hence, there is a lack of, uh, uh, I would say, alignment between the industry and the universities in terms of the skills required by the industry, and also to see how we could take it to the next level. Uh, I think the biggest vacuum that we see in terms of leadership, thought leadership and entrepreneurship uh, at the mid and upper tiers, uh, at that I would blame even, even from the universities to the private sectors to the public sector, that first need to get put right for us to un uh, address the serious issue in terms of uh, employable graduates into the IT industry and other industries because today uh, if you look at uh, I would think in, in this day and era, the shores of Sri Lanka does not become an inhibitor in terms of your resourcing strategy. I think a classic case I just was talking to you about the Kenyan affair. They are, if they could source terrorists on the internet, why not source human resources on the internet? Because there is this phenomenal uh, thing which is emerging called crowdsourcing, where like, if you look at Procter & Gamble, 80% uh, of their product strategies emerges from their consumer. Consumers giving feedback, consumers uh, actively contributing into the product development. And today, I don't think uh, this day and era, we should restrict ourselves to the human resources being Sri Lankans. It could be anywhere from the world. And we should be able to tap the best potential from across the world and, and create a business model out of it. And there lies our uh, opportunity to leapfrog. And that needs entrepreneurship, thought leadership to be different. Speaking of IT entrepreneurship, are there any success stories that you can share with us? Uh, of late, uh, there have been a lot because I, I would think uh, in the last couple of years there have been a lot of initiatives uh, through ICT spiralation. Then um, Slashcom has been having this hackathon. Uh, of recent, uh, in the last two years, we've been having this MIT startup labs. Uh, and a lot of, at least I would know about uh, five to ten companies have got funded. Uh, venture capitalism is here to stay. They are taking a serious look at our market, which is something which was missing today because gone are the years when you had a good idea, you go to a bank, they'll say, what do you have to mortgage, right? Uh, today, at least, there are companies who are willing to take a bet on an idea and, and give them the seed capital to start. And a lot of university students, straight from graduation, are getting into a business mode, which is good. Uh, the biggest challenge that we've seen in all, a lot of these initiatives is students have good ideas, but they don't know how to put a bankable proposal. Uh, they are technologically good, commercially not viable, right? So where do you take a good idea in terms of uh, an execution? And that's where the guidance is coming from the, the Angel Network uh, people as well as even uh, Orion City. You know, a lot of these guys are involved. So which is, which is something which is good, but I think it, it needs more formality going forward so that there is a, a much more vibrant venture capital thing. And I feel private sectors also have to probably uh, get into the venture capital mode of funding ideas in terms of even anticipating it to fail. What are you seeing around the world? What are the emerging trends? Emerging trends uh, is frightening at times, but uh, probably, as I said, 2020, we are looking at something like 50 billion devices being on the net. So it's going to be, uh, I would say, consumerization of everything uh, in today's context. Uh, whatever you buy is a commodity, right? There, there is no, you'll buy a phone, you'll buy something next six months it becomes outdated because the window of advantage is shrinking. Then you're also talking, uh, seeing, uh, in other words, uh, confluence of data, right? Today, uh, you have data about you on social media, on internet, on uh, more legal media, but you wouldn't know exactly what's out there until you do some research. If you if you Google your name, you will know a whole heap of things will come up you, you even didn't know that existed, right? So. That's going to give a uh, different spin in terms of uh, uh, power to a consumer. Yeah, today, the consumer has a lot more information at his fingertips before he consumes. So that puts a lot of pressure on uh, the business folks as well in terms of ensuring there is 
there's ethics, there's transparency because you can't hoodwink anybody, right? Today, if someone complains on social media saying this experience was not good, that spreads like wildfire. So uh, reputation management, a lot of these new th trends are emerging from our technology space. And uh, into the future, you're going to see more and more you're going to be surrounded by technology and you will not come to terms with it. So because of that, today, a lot of research is going on in terms of machine to machine communication. And you will see, you will become uh, uh, a citizen of a digital era. Where a lot of things will happen for you without you even knowing, right? For example, now, say I, in the morning I wake up and I, I go for a jog. Uh, while jogging from my wristwatch or my phone, I could say, set my temperature to this on my microwave. So my food will be ready when I get home. And uh, the scary part of all of this is that every part of it is touched by a computer and connected on the internet. It also, as I said, technology double-edged sword. It gives a lot more opportunity for hackers and guys who want to do cyber crime. So in conclusion, what are your expectations of Sri Lanka's IT industry, say, in the next five to ten years? The next five to ten years is going to be very crucial uh, from a Sri Lankan context. Uh, today, uh, I would like to probably uh, park some thoughts. Uh, today we spend about 500 million in, in IT and 70% of that goes into hardware. 10% uh, in software, 15% in services. So today a lot of the businesses, governments, uh, public sector look at ITS and this utility, like electricity, right? So there is no strategic advantage you get by investing money in hardware. Your strategic advantage comes in software and services. So, so, and today we spend about less than 0.1% of our GDP and companies less than 0.5% of the turnover. Whereas the benchmark is about 3 to 4% of GDP or 2 to 3% of companies turnover in terms of IT investments. So we need to get to that benchmark and businesses and uh, the government need to understand the role and the capacity of IT in terms of giving them the competitive edge. So unless we kind of clearly articulate that and understand that, I don't think uh, we are going to see uh, the numbers growing. Because compared to annual growth rate in India and China on IT spend is about 12 to 15%, them being a 1.23 billion population. And we are probably close to about the 10%, but the growth is on hardware, not on the, on the applications or the services, which is something important for us to get up there and e-government is something which is happening but not at the pace that uh, which should be happening in terms of I'm saying even identity management, passports, the, the automation of all of these should have happened about a decade, decade back but still we are struggling to uh, get the e-government structures enforced where it matters and which will enable us to also see the, see the benefits flowing to the masses. Thank you, Ramesh. It's been absolutely great talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for having me here. So we've been chatting with Ramesh Shanmugnathan, Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer of John Keels Holdings on the IT industry and what's exactly happening out there. On the other side, we have the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, who will give you some insight on the Business Confidence Index and opining on the state of the economy, economist and LMD columnist, Deshal Dimet. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC.
Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, with the latest in the Business Confidence Index. Now, Shaheen, the BCI, after gaining, gaining ground in August of this year, has once again dipped by 10 basis points. What are the reasons behind this yeah. drop? I think the pickup was more of a slight pickup. Uh, and uh, it has sort of come back to the sort of the level it was in the month before, basically in July. So I think I would say the BCA has been more or less flat. And uh, so we need to see, uh, you know, in, I'm saying the last three months, and we need to see whether going forward they would actually recover, has it reached the trough, or whether it would sort of go down further. We need to wait and see. I think one of the factors contributing to uh, this is, has been also the steady decline, the creeping decline, I would say, of the... Sri Lankan rupee. But even confidence in our economy seems to be reversing. Now, what sensitivities have led to this? Anushan, I think finally the business sector is impacted um, about what consumers feel and do. So, consumer confidence, you know, the feel good factor is low. And uh, this is particularly because of, you know, people feeling that, you know, their incomes are not keeping in line with inflation. And also in the rural sector, in the agriculture sector, particularly where agriculture growth has been flat in the last quarter. Uh, which has, uh, you know, contributed to this feeling. Uh, and therefore, you know, the business sector is sort of reflecting this, especially in the short term rather than in the medium or long term. And uh, also the business sector's opinion, I think, would have been impacted by the slowdown in consumer spends, obviously. And also the high bank rates and the depreciation or the gradual sort of decline or instability, I would say, as I said earlier, of the Sri Lankan rupee. What are your projections, Shahi? Now, there was a gain in August, as we have said previously, but uh, things seem to have gone back to a negative view. Uh, are we going to see more of the same in the months to come? I feel that confidence, uh, especially in the business sector, would remain around the same level, maybe plus or minus 10 points, you know, for the next two, three, four months. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, once uh, sort of the big ticket items like... Uh, like the Colombo port expansion and other projects, you know, infrastructure related items start paying dividends and we see visible uh, sort of evidence the business sector would, I think, uh, sort of uh, the confidence should go up. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, with the latest on the Business Confidence Index. After a short commercial break, we will have economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraj and with me now is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Now, Deshal, the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke has said that the U.S. would start to taper its $85 billion a month quantitative easing program. Now, how would this affect us? Yeah, uh, to answer that, let me just give you some context and some a little bit of the background to this. Um, for the last five years, the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve has been injecting the global economy with 85 well, uh, significant amounts of um, of capital and that has created a lot of liquidity uh, which has enabled all emerging economies and frontier markets like Sri Lanka to have access to a, a pool of uh, relatively low cost capital and that has been used to finance uh, growth and has enabled most of these countries to keep interest rates low and also supported the exchange rates. Now with the, with the tapering of this uh, quantitative easing what will happen to all the emerging markets and frontier economies? And we've seen this from June itself, when this, uh, from the time the tapering has been mooted. Um, is a, a general trend of increasing interest rates in emerging markets and frontier markets, and also a weakening of their currencies. And now we've seen this from countries ranging from Indonesia, India, 
um, the Philippines and several other countries. India and Indonesia have been the most significantly affected. And Sri Lanka also had uh, similar, kind of, uh, similar kind of implications. And we've seen since, uh, since June there has been a, a tendency of uh, our interest rates also to just edge up slowly in the secondary market, a little bit of weakening on the exchange rate as well mainly on some of the expectations of bondholders in Sri Lanka's, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka's uh, government security markets. This hasn't been as significant as we've seen in countries like India and Indonesia, but this has started to take place and going forward with uh, when tapering eventually comes off to its, uh, uh, to its completion, maybe in the next 18, 18 months, 24 months, then we would see this kind of uh, taking on in a, a greater momentum. Taking this into account, Tejal, how would this affect Sri Lanka's uh, interest rates? With the decision by the Fed to delay tapering in their, in their September meeting, there's been a little bit of relief that has been given to all frontier markets, emerging markets, Sri Lanka included. Uh, so because of that, there's been a little bit of window of opportunity also for some of the other bond issuances, and we'd expect some of Sri Lanka's uh, banks and uh, other financial institutions to tap the market during this time. And this would actually... Uh, create a brief pre period of, um, of support for interest rates, to allow interest rates to come down a little bit in the short term. But going forward, when, it, when tapering does take uh, full effect, I'd expect interest rates to slowly start aging up again, in line with what we're seeing in other frontier markets and emerging markets as well. Now, there has been a lack of credit growth in the economy. Now, what sensitivities have led to this? I think from, uh, again, if you look from a couple of years back, 2010, 2011, we had very strong credit growth over 30% in, uh, in, in some, case, uh, some periods. Uh, and in, there was a little bit of overheating that was, uh, that was seen towards the middle part, latter part of 2011. And the central bank, I think, quite um, prudently raised interest rates uh, beginning in, uh, in early 2012, around February, and then again in, uh, in April, May. Um, so <coughs> with, that, uh, with those increases in interest rates and also the credit ceiling that was applied in uh, 2012, there was a, a natural slowing down in, uh, in credit growth. And it has taken some time for this to pick up again. Credit ceiling was removed uh, in the early parts of this year. Market interest rates have also come down. Um, but it, there's usually a bit of a time lag for monetary policy to really filter through into actual credit growth. Indications from the market are that, this has, that there has been a little bit of improvement in uh, credit demand in the last couple of months. That's in, say, August, September. Uh, we need to wait and see how this kind of filters through and whether the momentum really gathers to become a more substantial uh, level of credit growth. What about our external trade situation? Uh, where do you see this going forward? In terms of uh, the global economy, we've seen some improvements in the, in the U.S. economy, which has been, I think, quite positive uh, in terms of consumer sentiment and also in terms of reduction of their household and um, and market leverage that really helps demand in that sense. So there is potential for Sri Lankan export uh, growth to the US, which we haven't really seen for the last few years. Europe is our other major market, uh, and we have seen an, uh, an, the end of the recession in Europe, but still the growth is really not robust enough to, to, to have a kind of meaningful and uh, material impact for our exporters. So in terms of our two major uh, global markets for exports, it's, there's an improvement, but really, uh, I don't think it's going to be something that we can, you know, really rely on uh, as a as a major major stimulus uh, for our for our export sector. In terms of emerging markets as well, um, there has been a slight slowdown in a lot in some of the countries we've seen, particularly in countries like China, uh, which has resulted uh, in some uh, commodity prices also coming down, which is good for our import sector because a lot of the commodities commodity imports the prices have come down, which supports us in terms of our import costs. Um, and that has been reflected as well. We've seen our exports picking up in the last uh, couple of months. Imports has also, have also been growing. Uh, but in general, we're seeing a slightly more positive situation on our uh, external sector, particularly in the export front, than what we've seen in the, in the last couple of years. So I think that's a, it's a good sign overall. That was economist and LMD columnist Deshal Demel. Thank you for watching Benchmark, and we hope to see you again next time.